The subject in our temples this morning is entitled, Be a Friend to All, or How to Be a Friend to All, and the broader subject of friendship in general. And when I heard that topic, I mean, I saw, okay, that's what uh, the subject is today. That's what I'll get some, look and get some ideas for it came to mind, I was involved with our boys' youth program for many, many years, years ago. And uh, I was struck by one of the, it, it became obvious that one of the subjects that was, if not one of the most important, almost the most important topic that they wanted to talk about or had questions about, and it was around this subject of friendship. They, they had questions about, you know, the, the, the companions, the friends they had, what to do in different situations that were coming up in their life. But beyond that, it was obvious already then they were forming this sort of natural wish to have somebody they could count on, some real good friend, some good mate that, that uh, would be with them during their, the difficult times, the fun times, all the above. Maybe we... Remember as well, thinking back to our youth, our teen years, how uh, you know, relevant the topic of friendship was, not only navigating through the uh, interesting times of uh, being in school and the peer groups and students and so forth, but also how important if we were able to find somebody that we could count on, somebody that we could trust, somebody that and found that same uh, trust in us. And yet I was wondering if somehow does it happen or does it happen to some where, you know, as, as we move into our adult years, whether we lose a little bit of that or, or uh, you know, it, it's not that it's not important anymore, but somehow maybe we start drifting apart or we start separating or in some way... Um, Something happens, or, and what is it that happens if that does? You may have heard um, how it's been said that loneliness is one of the greatest afflictions of our time. I mean, there's so many people everywhere, and there's so much going on. But, and it's interesting, even when we're around people, we can have a sense of, of being alone, or, or even perhaps that sense of loneliness. And this Mother Teresa of Calcutta, um, she... Uh, she talked a fair amount about this uh, affliction of loneliness. And she once said that there's uh, many people in the world who are dying for a piece of bread, but there's far more dying for a little love. And she's in a position where she can make that comment because that was her life to, to minister to those who were, were dying for a piece of bread. But she found what, you know, was meant most to, even to those, was the love that they were being given, a little bit of kindness, a little bit of friendship. And this topic and subject of friendship was so important to our, our guru as well. When he first came to the West in 1920, one of the poems, first poems he uh, penned was entitled, On Coming to the New Old Land, America, in which he, one of the lines is, sleeping friends, sleeping memories, of friends once more to be, did greet me sailing over the sea. And he maintained that this quality of friendship is really the basis of any successful and meaningful relationship we have. Whatever that relationship is, friend and friend, husband and wife, brother and sister, brother and brother, employee and manager, whatever it is, that, that those qualities of friendship is what uh, beautify, what enliven, what, what gives meaning to that relationship because it's founded on respect, on kindness, on consideration. Our guru even used the word that it's important to have a bit of reverence for our friend. And so before getting further into the subject, let's 
begin as we always do with an opening prayer. And let's invoke what, who our guru called the friend of all friends. And we know he even used that. He even uh, included that concept of God as the divine friend in our invocation. Father, mother, friend, beloved God. So let us have our opening prayer. And when we pray from our hearts, this prayer, it's also a technique of communion. It's a very powerful way to to withdraw our attention and connect with God in these various aspects. So please, let's all stand. And let's pray together. Heavenly Father, Mother, Friend, Beloved God, Jesus Christ, Bhagavan Krishna, Mahavatar Babaji, Lahiri Mahashai, Swami Sri Yukteswar, our Guru, Paramahansa Yogananda, saints of all religions, we bow to you all. O oh, divine friend, though the darkness of my ignorance be as old as the world, still make me realize that with the dawn of thy light, the darkness will vanish as though it had never been. Fill my heart with thy love. Fill my mind with thy wisdom. And fill my soul with thy never new joy. Om, peace, amen. Please be seated. Now let's have a few minutes of meditation that we might in an individual way contact that great spirit, contact that divine friend. You know, from the Bible, I love this, from the Psalms, be still and know that I am God. And I was reflecting on that. And God doesn't say, be still and believe that I am God, or be still and, you know, with some luck, you might get a little glimpse of me. Or He says, be still and know that I am God. That is that covenant, that is that pact that we have. And so this is why our guru said we start with the meditation posture because a, a meditation posture helps us to become still, to still the body. And when the body is still, then the mind also can become calm. So it's the main idea is to sit as best we can in this posture. Again, God, our master said, God watches the heart. The posture is there to help us to try to achieve the right meditation posture, but maybe depending on certain physical challenges we have, we do the best we can. And we always have the ability to have the right posture of the heart, heart open wide, to give our love and to receive that knowing response from God. So the spine is straight, the hands rest on the juncture of the thigh and the abdomen. And as the closer those hands can come to the, that juncture, then it, it automatically draws the shoulders back a little bit. And, and that naturally expands the chest. It's not like we're straining to do this, it's just, it's just the sort of mechanics, the, the hinge that as the hands are there, the shoulders are slightly back, the chest is out, and the breath flows naturally and calmly. And then the chin parallel to the floor, eyes closed or half closed, but it's often easier, especially in the beginning, for the eyes to be closed, but lifted gently, as we know, to that point between the eyebrows, which, again, every time I do that, it's just so amazing how that's half of meditation right there. It's like I lift, the, I lift the gaze, you lift the eyes, 
and the problems and the thoughts and what I have to do later and what I did yesterday, that somehow gets just dropped away. And it reminds me, oh, this is what I'm here for. I want to, I want to contact that knowing presence. I want to feel that stillness and that peace. And then to further relax body and mind, our guru has us inhale, and let's do that. We'll inhale, we clench the fists, tense the body, exhale and relax. We inhale, tense, exhale and relax. Once more, inhale and tense, exhale and relax. Now to take us into our Meditation, I'll read one of our Guru's whispers from eternity. He said, when you're no longer able to talk to me, read my whispers from eternity. He said, eternally through it, I will talk to you. And these whispers are his own super conscious realizations that vibrate in the ether and that when we tune in and meditate on them, use them to take us deeper into our own meditation, they work for us as well. And this one I read is entitled, Thou Art My Well-Wisher. And it's from the section in Whispers from Eternity, children's prayers. Hope you don't mind. But what this whisper is to again show us that God's in every part of our life. It's not out there past Jupiter or wherever or somewhere away from us. He's in everything. He's in our bodies, everything we do. So we can take this thought of his nearness, her nearness into our meditation and let these thoughts and truths take us to that deep place within. So our Guru's whisper, his meditation reads, Dear Heavenly Father, while I sleep, thou dost come to me as peace. When I awake, thou dost come to me as joy. When I love my friends, thou dost come to me as love. When I run, thou dost run with me. When I play, thou dost enjoy thyself too. When I think, thou dost think with me. When I will, thou dost give me the power to will. Teach me to play rightly, to think rightly, to will rightly, and to behave rightly. I want to please thee who art within me. I love to be guided by thee, for thou art my greatest well-wisher. So let's meditate together on these thoughts. Take them into our, into the silence within. When our guru was a young boy, with closed eyes, he asked the thought, what is behind the darkness of closed eyes? And then he had this beautiful vision of God's light. But he said, we can take that, we can probe. We know something is there in the stillness. What is, where are you, Lord? What are you? What am I? Come to me. So talk to God, pray to God, or just be still. Let that presence of God that comes as we are still fill us and be with us.
So again, our subject this morning is entitled, How to Be a Friend to All. It's nice to know already that, as was mentioned in the announcements, that we have friendly members here who will answer any and all questions that you have. So, so how to be a friend to all? And we might ask, you know, why should I be a friend to all? Or even, you know, how about somebody being nice to me for a change? Uh, kind of sense, and which is not an uncommon way for many people to think, present company excluded, of course. But there's that fear that I, I may lose something if I give something. So it's more than, you know, bad characters as much as sometimes it may just be a, a fear that, that is, again, fears are, are often, if not all the time, not real, but, but we, we think them to be so until we, we look at them, look fear in the face, and then it no longer troubles us. But as regards being a friend to all, there's a lot in it for us and for the other person. Because something interesting happens uh, in the laboratory of our life when we are friendly to someone else. Even if you know, we're on the street and we, we pass a so-called stranger and we, we find, we give them a smile. We may, we're surprised, like, well, where did that come from? It comes from God, our master said. It comes from the, the heart's natural love to, to be a friend, to, to just allow friendliness to express in our lives. And if we freeze that moment, if we can, what happens in that instant when we are friendly, when we give somebody a smile, when we do something like that? It's as if, like our troubles in that instant are gone. They're like for a moment, like our own burden. It's like it takes a back seat to our own life. We're just in a different kind of present moment. There's an expansion of our being in that instant. And our guru explained what happens when we trigger this metaphysical phenomena of friendliness, where we we're not thinking of our of ourself, but we become just in that moment part of something larger. We're our bigger self. And he said once, when you really do something for someone else without any thought of using that person for your own selfish ends or desires, then you have momentarily stepped into Christ consciousness. That's a big and wonderful statement that in that moment, you know, again, there are these concepts that we think Christ consciousness, well, yeah, someday or some lifetime or what is that? Or, um, but that we can think sometimes of Christ consciousness or even cosmic consciousness to be something uh, kind of mysterious or, or distant or esoteric. When our guru said, in that moment, we've stepped into that state of consciousness ourselves. That's what that consciousness is. It's, we become love in that moment. As simple as that, as deep as that, as profound as that. Of course, 
it's not lasting. That's what, but we can get a glimpse. We can get encouragement. We can, we can log that as a feeling of, of that feels good. It can motivate us. It, it, can, it can help us to want to and find it may be easier than we think to remain in that state of friendliness, of being a friend to all. On another occasion, referring to this spontaneous or selfless act of love and kindness, Paramahansa Yogananda said, God's effort to unite strife-torn humanity manifests itself within each heart as the friendship instinct. So I said, God's effort to unite strife-torn humanity manifests itself within each heart as the friendship instinct. Our guru called this God loving God, where this instinct within life to, for everything is searching to become whole. And so it makes sense that uh, we want to awaken that instinct. We want to allow that instinct within our hearts to come forth. I remember once our former president, Sri Dayamata, said uh, somewhat different uh, terms, but she's, she was reflecting once how Divine Mother looks down, so to speak. It's not like she's up there, we're down here, but looks at her children suffering and crying and complaining and whining. And, and she said, we have to keep Divine Mother happy. And, and she determined in her own life, I, I'm, going to, I'm going to help my mother. I'm going to help that, that my Divine Mother. And so this is the way, let's help God, let's help Divine Mother to remove a little suffering in the world, all the pain and all the heartache and heartbreak and suffering and that is around us, that's part of our, of our world. Well, here's a way, allow that friendship instinct within ourself. Let me be you know, one person that tries to help the divine to unite strife toward humanity, my own brothers and sisters, my family. And we do that by allowing that instinct to come forth in whatever large environment or small environment that we're in. Again, our Guru explained, it is not necessary to know and love all human beings and other creatures personally and individually. All you need to do is to be ready at all times to shed the light of friendly service over all living creatures whom you happen to meet. And he said, this attitude requires constant mental effort and preparedness, in other words, unselfishness. And he ends and says, the sun shines equally on diamond and charcoal, but the former has developed qualities that enable it to reflect the sunlight brilliantly, while the latter is unable to reflect the sunlight. And he said, emulate the diamond in your dealings with people. Brightly reflect the light of God's love. I mentioned Mother Teresa in the beginning, and I, thinking about this subject also, I, I remembered an incident in her life that I copied out here. It was when, it was after she received the Nobel Peace Prize in Stockholm, and she stopped in Rome on her way back to India. And while in Rome, a reporter asked for an interview, and the reporter was asking her some questions, and in effect was challenging her about the seeming futility of her efforts to make a a, a difference in the world. And the reporter said, Mother, you are 70 now. When you die, the world will be as it was before. What has changed after so much effort? And he said, Mother Teresa responded with a smile, you know, I never wanted to change the world. Isn't that great? And again, we might think, well, these world figures, that's their intention. I want to change the world. But here's what she said. I have only tried to be a a drop of pure water in which God's love can be reflected. And then she said, does that seem like a small thing to you? And she said the reporter fell silent. But then she went on. Why don't you try to to become a drop of pure water? Then there'll be two of us. And then she asked, are you married? Yes, Mother Teresa, great. Then go home and tell your wife and then we'll be three. 
Do you have children? Three children. Excellent. Then we'll, there'll be six of us already. So in her sphere and in our sphere, I mean, it's like throwing the pebble. Goodness is like throwing the pebble into a, into a, a pond or a lake. Ripples. Ripples. And then those ripple out just as different kind of behavior can have that same effect. And so our master said, running the world is his or her responsibility. But the point is, and I think the joy is, to let God use us in whatever way spirit wants to, to help spirit run the world. Help, to help spirit unite the world, unite all living things. Whether it's something big, whether it's something small, there's no, there's no uh, sort of uh, definition of, of those things, I believe, uh, in, the, in the mind of, of truth, in the mind of God, big or small. And I was reminded of a couple of other stories around this idea of reflecting the love of God. The first one had to do with one of the monks who spent a, a good number of years personally working with our former president, Sri Dayamata. And he shared a story how one day they were together and she looked at him and she said, what's the matter, dear? He said, you look a little down today. He said, oh, Ma, you know, I set out each day to I want to do so well and then I, I get all caught up in everything and I get upset and and I say something to somebody else I shouldn't have said, and, and then I feel even worse, and I get down on myself. You know, does it sound familiar? It's just this change. And so, so he said that uh, um, she got up from her desk and said, I'll be right back. And she came back, and she had a little mirror. And she gave it to him, and she said, every time you aren't the person you think you should be or you're striving to be, or you get down, she said, you take out this mirror and you look at it and you say, there he is, it's him again. And then she said, in that moment, briefly review what happened and then move on. And he said that he, he you know, she, he took the mirror from her, he looked at it and it's, it's sort of humorous in that moment when you look at yourself and he laughed, she laughed. And he's, you know, this was, this was probably, let me do some math here, probably about 50 years ago, he still has that mirror. You know, it's, a little, it's, a, it's just a precious keepsake for him. But more than that, because something, again, so simple can be a life lesson, something that, up oh, there he is again, there she is again. Ha ha, you know, it's okay. I, I'll learn, I'll move on. I... This story is about myself. I had a similar experience. I needed an even larger mirror than the little one that, uh, that he got. And uh, this is when I, I in my early uh, days as well, those were his early years in the ashram. I was in uh, Encinitas is where the, us as young monks begin our monastic life. And I was uh, with um, Brother Primoy, who is called the house brother. He's the, it's the name, he's the mentor and counselor for the young monks when, when we first come. And one day he, he, we were together and he looked at me and he said, oh, hi, Smiley. Now, I don't know if anybody's ever said that to you, but I can tell you for sure that your first reaction is anything but to smile in that moment. It's, you have kind of an opposite response when someone says, hey, Smiley. And to add uh, insult to injury, so to speak, he went like this. You know, he, he, pushed, he pushed up his fingers of his mouth. Now, he wasn't being sarcastic. He wasn't being mean. I, I guess my, it's, I think it's called our resting face or whatever, but he, and it, no doubt it wasn't the first time. And he knew, and we knew that he had our best, and he was being a friend, daring to, to uh, reflect something back. Because oftentimes we, you know, these are subconscious, whether it's, a, you know, a moods or sadness, something. That, and then when we're not engaged, kind of, you know, maybe the face drops, the, the heart drops. And so he caught that and he said, hi, Smiley. So, and then he said, you do it, what, 
And maybe you heard this technique our master gave. Um, but he said, you do what master says to do. He said, if you feel down, you go in front of the mirror and you push the corners of your mouth up. You know, we think that the, you know, again, the guidance of a God-realized guru is going to be like, okay, turn the lights down, light the incense. Um, it's going to be super mysterious and, and, uh, and esoteric and wow, you know, and, you know, ohm in the background and, no, he says, you, if you're sad, you go in front of a mirror, you put the corners of your mouth up. That is metaphysical. That is truth of the highest order. And again, I don't know if you've ever done that. If you don't need to do it, God bless you. And you might, if you just, if you want to try it today, you're going to have a great time. Because the, there, there's only one reaction, I think, that anybody can have when they do that. It's ridiculous. It's hilarious. It's just like, what's the matter? Not with me, like as if there's something wrong, but it just, it, it, it blows up in that instant. The, the, the grip that, that sadness or mood might have around us. Not that the situation goes away, but it, it restores our perception or, or it restores some of our balance to be able to try to look at that, try not to, to uh, be at the mercy of that experience, a hundred percent. And again, I was I was grateful that he reached out to me that way. I, I I haven't had to do that in a long time. It's ridiculous enough just looking in the mirror. I find. <laughs> I look. Oh my goodness, it's just wild. So, but anyway, as I so as our guru said, the way to happiness is to become like that diamond. We know that, again, it's, it's, it's intellectual, but it's also intuitive. We hear certain words and we just know, of course, to be, to be the diamond mentality, to reflect all the facets of that light. We love light. Light is just, it's more than a metaphor. It's, it's, it's our being. So our Guru said, that's the way. That's the way to our own happiness is to reflect to others, to be a friend to all, to reflect that kindness, reflect that compassion. If we don't feel love for that person, we can still reflect respect. We can honor, we can validate, we can be grateful. We can give to all things. We can treat them, this, this ahimsa, this nonviolence, this is, this is gigantic. It's the way these 10 commandments are the way to, to peace, to happiness, to our own happiness. We're not gonna lose by being kind. We're going to gain. And yet we don't do it for that because the, the act is its own reward, that experience. But something important here, that doesn't mean just because we are like this that everybody is going to want to be our friend. And that is really, I would say, very um, valuable to realize. The magnetism, our guru says, friendliness is very, very, very magnetic. And, and if we need any proof that we have a lot of friendship magnetism, just look around. Look at the company that we've attracted to be with others like this. All of us wanting to be the best version of ourselves, wanting to become diamond mentalities, wanting to do our best, wanting to help each other and be helped toward this incredible goal of our own self-realization. And beyond that, that we've attracted into our lives great masters like this. So, so it should and... and it should be, that's a good should, that it should be a sign of encouragement to us that, that we have so much, we've come so far, we have so much magnetism. But again, with that as context or background, it's important to realize despite all our good intentions that not everyone will or needs to understand or respond to us in the same way. And again, if we look at the examples of these great ones, not everyone responded to Christ or Krishna or our master with understanding. So why would we expect 100% of everybody we meet or work with or in our families or whatever that they're going to get us all the time, that they're going to um, you know, understand us? So our, our, our guru said on this point, he said, when I think of the many wonderful souls who have faith in me, not out of emotional blindness, but through intelligence and reason. I know I am very much blessed. And he said, of all possessions, I love true friendship most. And he said, be a friend to all. Even if your love and trust are betrayed by some, don't worry. Always be yourself. 
You are what you are. This is the only sincere way to live. And then he went on and said, though all may not want to be your friend, you should befriend all, never expecting anything in return. I understand and love all, but I never expect of anyone that he should be my friend and understand me. This is, this is the guru speaking. On the strength of this principle, I am at peace with myself and the world and never feel any cause for worry. It's like the words and wisdom of his own Guru Shikteshwar, you might remember, who said, I don't expect anything from others, therefore their actions can't be in opposition to wishes of mine. Amen. I mean, wow. But that doesn't mean that they're they may be unattached, but it doesn't mean they're uninvolved. It doesn't mean they're apathetic. They're, again, the most caring of all. But they, they're able not to take any rejection of that caring personally to heart because they've already established within themselves the greatest connection to their greatest friend, the greatest well-wisher, God, spirit itself. And so this is the same way in path to peace for ourselves. And I was thinking, we don't need the approval of everybody on earth to validate who we are in our self-worth. I mean, we have so many people, but sometimes that one person just, it's like, it just pulls us down like, no, it, 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 not everybody's gonna understand us. Some will think we're so great and love our personality. They'll be charmed by it. Others will be alarmed by it. Others, others will, you know, our idiosyncrasies will be so charming to some. To others, it'll just, it's just like, you know, fingernails on a blackboard or something. So it's, it's okay. It's like, it's so, it's such a, it's like being big. It's being big hearted. Okay, accept them. Maybe there's something for us to learn. Maybe their reaction is, oh, you know, I, I have this, I don't have to just be me in every situation. I can adapt. Why don't I, I, in order to meet that, person who may prefer that I be silent if, or that I engage more and I'm too silent or whatever, things like that. But if we do feel that hurt, that is a great moment. Grab it, I would say. Just, oh, pull that moment so close. That's the time to run to God. That's the time to run to our, our greatest well-wisher who always loves and appreciates us. Our Guru said, God understands you when everyone else misunderstands you. Because it's, in, it's inside. It's inside us. They get us. They know. They know. They know where we're coming from. He knows. She knows. He is the lover who cherishes you always, no matter what your mistakes. Others give you their affection for a while and then forsake you, but he abandons you never. That's why these great ones, they're, they're sort of living manifestations. They're just, talk about mirrors. They're just these transparent mirrors or portals of that love. So we have something in human form that gives us that kind of, of uh, unconditional, limitless understanding and acceptance. You know, if, we, if you've ever wondered what we're, told as monks, you know, what secret Jedi training we get, you know, and, and uh, well, I'll tell you what it is, like almost the first lesson you get, besides look in the mirror, and, is make a personal relationship with God, form a personal relationship with God, with, with Master, with the Guru, make it personal, bring them into your life, into your, into your lows, into your highs, into everything. And then we find, you know, that same monk who Brother Primoya called Be Smiley. He said, we do that. He said, after a while, we realize, it's so brilliant, not only will we realize that Divine Mother loves us, but we'll find she actually likes us as well. <laughs> Which is almost like we want to be liked. It's just, if we want to, we can't be liked more than by anyone than, than spirit itself. It's like, I didn't have it, uh, didn't copy anything out, but like Rumi and the Sufi poets, they describe, you know, the divine as being like delirious about us. 
You know, like God is a madman just running after us, you know, seeking our love and affection. That's, that's what that relationship we're told is, is, is the result of our own cultivating that relationship. And I was thinking, you know, what isn't to like about us if we think about it? There was some, I was trying to remember, there's some Russian saying that I heard about, uh, you know, people is who, who like, criticize their appearance or something. There's some, there's some folk or, or, you know, sort of wisdom statements that say, don't, it's like you're criticizing God. Don't do that. You're, we're a special creation. We're divine mother's child. What, what's not to like? It's, and our guru said, we should envy no one. He said, let others envy us. What we are, no one else is. Be proud of what you have and what you are. And he said, no one else has a personality just like yours. No one else has a face like yours. No one else has a soul like yours. You are a unique creation of God. How proud you should be. And I sometimes think, you know, I didn't create this face. And then maybe, it's, you know, maybe it won't find its way on some, you know, magazine, I don't think. <laughs> So I even like if I look in Self-Realization magazine and I say, oh my goodness, what am I doing in there? <laughs> but it's because I don't think of myself as the face. We're all subject to... But... And in this moment, let's all just for a second close our eyes. Where did our face go? It's gone. It, it's because what we are is what we feel. What I am is what I feel as my being of who I am. That's what I want to make beautiful. That's, that's what I want to bring out. My, I don't know if it's still a saying. My grandma, she used to tell me and my brother, she'd say, handsome is as handsome does. Is that still a, a saying? It, it works, though. It's a, it's a good one. There's not, because being handsome, acting in a handsome way, showing respect to people, being kind, being thoughtful, keeping your word, that makes you attractive, that makes you desirable. In fact, our, our guru said, there is no more beautiful ornament one may wear than a genuine smile of peace and wisdom glowing on the face. And I thought in the same way after I read that, I thought, you know, when somebody smiles, you don't think of the face anymore. The smile is like this connection to that person's being, to, that, to, that, to the person, to that person's soul, that, the innerness of that person. And I, and I was thinking too, that's like the, it's the meaning, it's this behind the more than symbolic gesture of the pronoun. My soul is bowing to your soul. Our hands come out of our heart, the energy through our fingers, offering that heart's energy to that soul. Before us, there's that chant of our guru in the land beyond my dreams, Heart-to-heart -heart meeting, spirit and soul's greeting. I don't know if, if, uh, if you know this uh, author, Robert Fulgham. He was, it's some years, he was uh, known for these simple um, kind of observations, essays. He was an author about, about life, but very, very astute at the same time. You know, I mentioned the youth retreat and the kids and all, so, so here's what he said. And then we'll close, we'll pray for others. He said, all I really need to know about how to live and what to do and how to be, I learned in kindergarten. He said, wisdom was not at the top of the graduate school mountain, but there in the sand pile at Sunday school. These are the things I learned. Share everything. Play fair. Don't hit people. Put things back where you found them. Clean up your own mess. Don't take things that aren't yours. Say you're sorry when you hurt somebody. Wash your hands before you eat. Flush. Warm cookies and cold milk are good for you. Live a balanced life. Learn some and think some and draw and paint and sing and dance and play and work every day some. Take a nap every afternoon. When you go out into the world, watch out for traffic, hold hands, and stick together. Be aware of wonder. 
Remember the little seed in the styrofoam cup. The roots go down and the plant goes up and nobody really knows why or how, but we are all like that. Goldfish and hamsters and white mice and even the little seed in the styrofoam cup, they all die and so do we. And then remember the Dick and Jane books and the first word you learn, the biggest word of all, look. And then he ends and says, everything you need to know is in there somewhere. The golden rule and love and basic sanitation, ecology and politics and equality and sane living. Take any one of those items and extrapolate it into sophisticated adult terms and apply it to your family life or your work or your government or your world and it holds true and clear and firm. Think, he said, what a better world it would be if we all, the whole world, had cookies and milk about three o'clock every afternoon and then lay down with our blankies for a nap. <laughs> or if all governments had as a basic policy to always put things back where they found them and to clean up their own mess. <laughs> and he said, it is still true, no matter how old you are, when you go out into the world, it is best to hold hands and stick together. So again, we're so, we can count Many blessings, but this blessing of our temple here, this, our guru called this the happy family of self-realization, this family of friends. Friends once more are to be, we have become, helping each other forward. And whether we can be here in person or virtually now through the wonders of our early Dwapara, he said, come regularly, join this family of self-realization regularly. He said, those who do so have changed. He said, I see it in their eyes and faces. And he said, in that regularity and steadfastness, you shall find God realization. So I know my gratitude for this family, for what comes back, and, and, and this gratitude for this happy family of self-realization. Before we close, please stand. We'll send out those healing vibrations. This is the, we want to be a friend to all. Pray for all. Pray, pray, pray. That we might help rev leave some of that suffering of our strife-torn family. So please pray after me. Heavenly Father, Thou art omnipresent. Thou art in all Thy children. Manifest Thy healing presence in the bodies, minds, and souls of all those who need divine help. Let's raise our arms, let's chant, send out vibrations of healing for the body. Oh. For the healing of the mind. Oh. And for the healing of soul ignorance. Oh. And for world peace and harmony. Om. Let's pray, Heavenly Father, Mother, Friend, Beloved God, Great Gurus, we bow to you all. Beloved God, may thy love shine forever on the sanctuary of our devotion. And may we be able to awaken thy love in all hearts. Om. Peace. Amen.